Waro me, welcome. Thanks for joining me for the second of our Animal in the Houses talks that explores the connections with animals across our museums and collections. I'm Anna Kosu, the curator of the How to Move a Zoo exhibition, now showing at the Museum of Sydney. I'm speaking to you today from Gadigal Country. In the spirit of reconciliation, Sydney Living Museums acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people listening in today. Today we are joined by my colleague Michael Leck, who will present his talk titled A Parade of Animals in Nurseries. Michael is a curator at Sydney Living Museum with responsibility for the Cowlin Simpson Library and Research Collection. He's curated the exhibition, Marion Hall Best, Interiors, and co-curated with Megan Martin, Dream Home, Small Home. Michael has also written and presented on various aspects of the history of houses, interiors, domestic furnishings in Australia, including authoring a book on the extensive wallpaper collection held, held by Sydney Living Museums. He's also engaged in ongoing research into the rise and development of Australia's department stores and furnishing trades. If you have any questions for Michael, please pop them into the chat and he'll answer them at the end. It is my great pleasure to introduce you to Michael. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. And thank, thank you everyone for joining us today for the talk. Hopefully it will be a bit of fun and you'll learn something as well. Well, that's the idea at least, I suppose. So I'm going to uh, share my screen now and uh, I will turn my video off for the length of the, um, the talk as well. Okay, so today's talk is really, as I said, a potted history of the children's nursery. Now the children's nursery can simply be defined as a particular room or rooms in a home that have been set aside for children for some or all of the following, for sleeping, play, learning, bathing, engaging in hobbies, crafts, games, etc. cetera. Uh, the nursery as a space first appeared in uh, middle-class homes in the early 19th century. And uh, one of the first references to the nursery comes in 1838. Uh, when the English author John Loudon wrote that the nursery is a room set apart for the children till they are three or four years of age for purposes of bathing, washing, and with a water closet. And then there was also a schoolroom for older children that uh, may adjoin the nursery. Now, the idea of what a nursery could be, of course, changed uh, during the 19th and 20th century uh, and expanded. Uh, to what it could become. And uh, as I mentioned, there are other activities that uh, took place there. Now, the reason the nursery became a special room set aside for children relates to really the increasing disposable income of middle-class houses. Um, uh, of course, the middle classes built larger homes that were separated from their places of work. And as a result, there was an opportunity to reimagine the different spaces in the home. And one idea was to set aside specific room or rooms for children. It was also the case, of course, at the time that the needs of children were starting to be seen as quite different to those of adults, especially in that um, middle-class family. Initially, the design and furnishing of the nursery was to be as practical as possible. Plain walls and simple furnishings and furniture of an appropriate height and use for children. So furniture makers began producing a whole line of items specifically for children. The image on the screen from uh, 1874 was published in the furniture pattern book of a Melbourne based furniture maker, WH uh, Rock and Company, and shows various types of children's high chairs. So it was part of just their general stock in trade. But of course, if you didn't have a large house in which you could devote rooms to children's activities, you had to make do with your circumstance. 
such as in this uh, humorous illustration on the screen now, published in Melbourne Punch in 1855 and entitled Domestic Bliss in Australia. Of course, chaos really reigns in this image, which shows, uh, if you look closely, uh, on the far right, there's a, a shoemaking business in the front room, uh, center at the back, there's music practice, uh, and there's all sorts of other activities going on, including lots of children creating chaos and playing games and one there banging a drum on the uh, far right. So not everyone, of course, could have their perfect nursery. But this one from this illustration from about 1900 is an ideal nursery certainly an idealized space comprising at least two rooms, a playroom in the main illustration and a bedroom glimpsed here through the open door. The main room is notable for its spaciousness and lack of clutter, which is really quite unlike preferred furnishings in other parts of the home at this time. In fact, one of the for the previous 50, 50 years or so, uh, the last half of the 19th century, one of the most oft repeated requirements of a good nursery was that it should be airy, dry, light and cheerful. And the need to have a clean and sanitary envir environment, which was different to today's standards, of course, different sanitation, became increasingly important to prevent childhood illnesses. But in those same 50 years, the last 50 years of the 19th century, the ideal nursery went from one that some critics said can scarcely be too simple and plain to one which was more highly decorated, like the image here. So although there's not, not too much furniture, too much clutter, there's plenty of decoration. And if you look closely, you'll see towards the top of the room there, there's a, there's a frieze, wallpaper frieze, which depicts Noah's Ark, a whole series of animals, two animals together joining to, uh, to move on to the Noah's Ark. And, if, and the use of the Ark and the animals, the parade here of animals, was um, something that uh, was quite common in the last part of the 19th century. Um, in 1880, there's an English writer, Robert Eddis, wrote in his book on decoration and furniture of townhouses, he wrote this, the various birds, beasts and reptiles that went into the ark, these would make the children's room a bright, cheery spot and in pleasant guise, teach them many things better than all the lesson books in the world. And he went on, to surround our little ones with decoration and everyday objects in which there shall be grace and beauty of design and colour will imbue them with a love and appreciate an appreciative feeling for things of beauty and harmony. So childhood now needed both a healthy environment and, that, and also one that was colourful, beautiful, well designed. And it's around this period, the last part of the 19th century, that wallpapers and furnishing fabrics began to be specially designed for children. Up until then, they weren't really things uh, people just made do with what they could find. Um, <clears throat> the most common designs in this period were meant to be educational or morally improving subjects and were often reproduced directly from book illustrations, such as this illustration this uh, design uh, on screen entitled months, as in months of the year, each scene a different month, adapted from Kate Greenaway's Almanac, which was published in the 1880s and 1890s. Greenaway was a popular and successful illustrator of children books, children's books at the time. What is interesting is that, that these wallpapers for children stand separate from those designed for other parts of the home in this period. Wallpapers and furnishing textiles for other parts of the home typically depicted stylized flora or even simple geometric patterns. It was certainly unfashionable to use wallpaper showing scenes similar to greenways um, in other parts of the home. Another example of a, a nursery or children's wallpaper 
this time from the Carolyn Simpson Libraries collection, is this one. Um, the illustration at left gives you uh, a larger view and the one at right gives you a more detailed view. And it illustrates um, the tale, Dick Whittington and his cat. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with that one, but um, uh, the, the wallpaper itself was uncovered some years ago during renovations of a homestead known as Terragong at Merowa in the Upper Hunter region, region of New South Wales. And it's lost some of its original color. It's a little worse for wear, but the pattern is still clear. Each scene is like a page from a book of a children's tale. The image on the right, as I mentioned, is the detail. And the story in this case goes, um, and it's an instructional story, a rags to riches tale um, about Dick, Dick Whittington, when he was a boy. He was very poor, but taken in by a kindly merchant who gives him a job as a cook's assistant. Now the, the room that he's allocated to sleep in is in the garret in the top of the house. And that room is depicted the bottom left-hand corner of um, the illustration, the right-hand illustration, the bottom left-hand corner, you can see Dick in bed and his bed is overrun by mice. I'm not sure if you can see that, but I can assure you it's the case. Then the, the scene next to that, sort of in the middle there, is Dick being given um, a cat by the merchant's daughter to help chase away the mice so that um, Dick doesn't have this trouble of uh, having mice all over his bed. And, and so the and so on the, the story goes on and it's a tale that uh, is quite old you know it goes back to at least the 14th century and it's based on um, a real story uh, of Dick and who would eventually become the mayor of London and it was meant to be instructional it was meant to be show how Dick who was quite poor um, was a humble character and worked hard and with the help of the merchant became wealthy himself and a successful businessman and married the merchant's daughter to boot. <clears throat> Although such instructional wallpapers um, didn't really last much past the 19th century, um, the idea of putting nursery rhymes or fairy tales onto wallpaper and furnishing fabrics persisted for many years. <clears throat> Here's another wallpaper, this time from the mid 20th century, and it shows a whole range of nursery rhymes. Um, and if you look closely, again, you'll see the full wallpaper on the left and a detail on the right, uh, a whole range of different stories, Three Bears, Jack and Jill, Little Miss Muffet, Sing a Song of Sixpence, and the um, detail on the right there is Hey Diddle Diddle. Uh, if you look closely, hey diddle diddle, the cat and the fiddle, the cow jumped over the moon, the little dog laughed to see such sport, and the dish ran away with the spoon. It's quite clever, all of those figures appear in that one illustration. But in the early 20th century, just to go back a little bit, <clears throat> the main change was that wallpapers and furnishing fabrics for children went from being instructional to unashamedly entertaining, designed to amuse, though some might still have an educative component. At the same time, they developed a fashion for wallpaper freezers, and these seem to be perfect, a perfect vehicle to convey an amusing story, a series of characters along the length of the freeze, or even a parade of animals. an example, four different examples on the screen at the moment. <clears throat> now on the screen is another ideal nursery, this time from 1929. And accompanying this illustration, <clears throat> there is this description. 
The decorative interest can be supplied in this room by a wide frieze surrounding the room at a height of about four foot from the floor. Now that's important. So the frieze has gone from being up near the ceiling to four foot from the floor where children can uh, get a better sense of it. Artistic and delightful friezes featuring Noah's Ark and farmyard pictures are obtainable and are an unending source of delight to the children. So again, we have this idea that Noah's Ark uh, has persisted as a theme for at least 50 years. The room is light, colourful and airy, but also practical with what seems like lino on the floor, a cot fitting into a nook on the left and a fireplace surround to prevent young hands getting burnt. Shortly afterwards, in 1933, the Australian popular magazine, The Australian Home Beautiful, which of course is still published today, published a feature on how to furnish the modern nursery in which it explained the, the evolving attitudes to raising children. Never have children been so studied as in the present time. In house planning, as in all else, their needs have been considered in every way. In fact, the needs of children in the popular press went beyond concerns about health and education to include the social and psychological effects of a child's environment on their upbringing. So the nursery or, or playroom could or should be designed in the right manner for the, psych, uh, the psychological benefit of, and of children. It was often written that toys within the, uh, the nursery or playroom nourish the imaginative life of the child, thus making a crucial contribution to a child's development. And of course, if you had a playroom or nursery at home, it needed to be filled with amusements for the children. Now, all kinds of toys, including uh, animal push and pull toys, like those on the screen, have been around for millennia, not just, of course, used in the nursery. The timber horse on the right comes from a, the Roman period in Egypt, the first and third century AD. And the animal on the left is a spotted deer or chital, uh, indigenous to many parts of Northern India. You may have seen this toy at Elizabeth Farm. It's a replica of one still owned by the MacArthur family at Camden Park. And the original one dates from the first half of the 19th century. So quite old, really. And there's plenty of evidence that toys that included uh, animals uh, were in use by children right through uh, the 19th and into the 20th century, including a couple that are on the screen. I thought they're quite cute sort of photographs. The boy with the rocking horse on the left and another with a toy bear on the right. Sydney's largest department store, Anthony Horden and Sons, in 1900, um, in its mail order catalogue, stated, to list our toys in our store would be impossible. There are too many for such treatment and that the following are only a few of the toys already in stock. Donkeys, sheep, cats, dogs, bears, goats, squirrels, elephants, cows, and other animals. Again, they mentioned Noah's Ark. By 1923, 23 years later, the Horden's catalog, which you can see on the screen now, declared that as far as toy animals were concerned, it had variety enough to stock a zoo, including cloth and plush kangaroos. And Horden's range of toys was spread over several pages of its catalogue. Department stores are also notable in this period for incorporating other child-friendly friendly attractions into their stores, places to play and be amused pageants, plays, pantomimes, to keep children and their parents in the store. The commercialization of children's activities and toys spread 
and companies like Disney began licensing toy and other manufacturers with the rights to reproduce characters like Mickey Mouse, Minnie Mouse and Snow White. In Australia, an equivalent on a smaller scale was of course Felix the Cat. In this amusing photo, well, I think it's amusing, a relatively large Felix is seemingly being strangled at Nielsen Park Beach by two girls, little girls in the 1920s. And soon retailers emerged that specialised only in children's toys, games and activities like the Walther and Stevenson Emporium in George Street, Sydney. The front cover of its magazine, Come Catalogue, as shown on the screen now, shows all the wonderful toys and games you can, fill, you can buy to fill your empty playroom or nursery at home. What is interesting in terms of house design is that even in the modernist interior, which was taking shape in the 1920s and 30s, there was space for a children's nursery. The one on screen, taken from the book Colour Designs for Modern Interiors, incorporate some of the features of a typical modernist interior, including a reduction in ornament and numerous built-ins, built-in wardrobes, shelving, even um, a nook there for sitting. And still there's space for an elephant pool toy. Although modernism avoided ornament, there was often still room for pattern furnishing textiles in a modernist interior, such as these two designed by Hungarian emigre, George Karodi for the Sydney firm Artes Studio in the late 1940s. Both are clearly designed for children's rooms. The one on the left called Lullaby Land. And interestingly, Karodi has incorporated some of the designs and motifs motifs of his native Hungary with Australian motifs. The design on the right playfully depicts both Australian and exotic flora. But the majority of new homes being built after World War II in Australia were small. There was a shortage of building materials, builders and homes for newlyweds, returned servicemen and women, and recent immigrants. As a result, many of these small homes had to be flexible and accommodate multiple uses into one room or space. The living room might also be used during certain hours as a children's playroom, as shown on the cover of the Australian Home Beautiful at left from 1947. But by the 1950s and 60s, possibly one of the greatest changes to the design of children's rooms and play spaces was that children, especially older children like teens, started to, to have a larger role in the planning of their own rooms. An article in the April 1964 edition of Australian House and Garden asks, how soon should, you, should a child help with decor? And then answers, as soon as he or she shows any interest in the idea and then goes on to assign boys and girls with particular gender specific roles. A boy can design build, and build his own study and hobby shelves, arrange interesting displays for the wall, suggest color schemes and furniture arrangements. Whereas a girl can make her own simple drapes, scatter cushions, felt pictures. Both can paint walls or help hang wallpaper. The furnishings available, including wallpaper in the post-war period, then had, had to, of course, keep pace with the latest popular trends in order to stay relevant to the interests of children who were helping design their own rooms. The wallpaper at right of the Cowboys uh, captures a huge popularity for such TV shows in the 1950s and 60s set in the American West. On the other hand, the wallpaper at far left seems to capture some of the hippie zeitgeist of the late 1960s with its types of clothes, flowers, flowers in the hair and rabbits in love. Yet there was always room for friendly animals like the wallpaper in the center to hang on the walls of a young children's room, nursery or bedroom. 
thank you. That's the end of the, the talk. Thanks again, Michael. Um, I hope you can join me next Thursday when we'll be joined by Mel Flight. So that's next Thursday at four o'clock and she'll present another fascinating talk. And her talk is titled Queen Victoria's Pet Portraits. So for more information um, and to, to book, please go to the website and you'll see that link in the chat. Have a lovely afternoon, everyone. Thanks, Michael.